big part of it is do you get a quiver in your liver at the idea of leading people you know does it excite you mm. do you think yes i want to empower other people periodically ask for feedback you know after a meeting pull one of the trusted members aside say hey how was i in that meeting can you honestly tell me how it was was i great bad not so good where was i good where was i where could i been better establish a culture where it's safe to give feedback by asking for it and receiving it first. So modeling that, I think is something you need to do permanently. Welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor, and I'm passionate about helping entrepreneurs lead their ideal lives by creating better businesses. I'm a certified EOS implementer, an FBA accredited family business advisor, and a business owner myself with several business interests. I work with established business owners and their leadership teams to help them live their ideal entrepreneurial life using EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. Today's guests are experts in the topic of people and leadership. They're a married couple working together with four kids that were homeschooled. They're best mates despite working together for five years in business and 21 years of marriage. And they're both completely fascinated with people and relationships and how to get the most out of relationships. On today's show, they're going to share with you how you can improve communication, clarity and accountability with your leadership team and with the people in your team to get the most from your business. So good morning and welcome to the studio, Ruth Sam. Lovely to have you here. Delighted. Ah, yeah. So I, you've got Harrowfield People being your own business. Tell us a bit about how you got to even come up with that idea and a bit of your background as to where, you, where you're from. Great. Yeah, I think um, the best way is that Ruth and I, we're a husband and wife team, and we always wanted to have our own business together at some point. And at, at one point, we just went, let's take some time out and figure out what that might look like. We hadn't had any plans to start anything or hadn't, didn't have a timetable. So we just sat down and said, well, where do we add value to the world? Where do, where, what do people appreciate us for? And what we landed on was uh, the ability to help others understand themselves, understand others, and then how to communicate in a way that's more effective, more efficient, more harmonious. And so that was the, that was the essence of it. Yep. And then through that and a bit of workshopping and just some good discussion, we settled on a, what effectively is a training business with a few extra kind of tools in the toolkit that we know really helps people when they're looking to collaborate better. So that's that's the origin story, really, of, of the business. So but what about your background, though? So, I mean, what were you doing before this? Well, in a way, I've been doing what we do as a business probably since I was a little girl. You know, I just was always the one in the playground at school reading, you know, reading situations, helping people to figure out their struggles, I read self-help books as a teenager <laughs> rather than <laughs> romance novels. I just think I've just always been really interested in what makes people tick and ended up doing organisational psychology in, as a study, but have gone into work for lots of different companies helping to develop their people. And I think for me, it's just, I just really love seeing development in individuals and in groups and I love doing that in the business world. And I think we both do really, don't we? We, we yeah. really have a, a real interest and passion in businesses doing well. I you know, seeing it as that, in a way, one way that I like to describe it is that for better or for worse, the workplace has become the modern village. You know, that it's, yeah. where, it's where people spend most of their, the best part of their working awake days mm -hmm. and also, it's where people find most of their connection. You know, a lot of their connection will come from work. And so if we can contribute to making that a better place for people, then that brings us a lot of joy. Yeah. So that's, yeah. I think that's what's behind yep. why yeah. we and do what we do. And there's, Perfect, common, yeah. there's common needs out there. There's, there's common kind of frustrations and pain points around how people relate with each other in the workplace or and relate to themselves sometimes and get frustrated with themselves that perhaps they're not getting to the things they want to do or... Um, and no one's perfect. We've all got our limitations and you just got to take a, a, one personality with all its history and story and you plop it into a particular you know, work environment and a particular culture. And 
good things happen and frustrating things happen. And and we're all about helping just to de- you know just translate that into ways that people can actually just work better and just be more more at peace with themselves and and enjoying their their work. Yeah, and the people and the people they work with. Absolutely. I think you're right about that being kind of the modern village because, I mean, really that's where we spend most of our time these days and, and most people are at work probably even more valuable time, if you like, than they are at home these days. Yeah, and and why not have that be a place where you're just at your best, you know, you're your best self and mm. your relationships at work are as strong as they can be and, yeah, and, and I just – brings a lot of joy to us doesn't it when we see that shift just a little bit more towards people being more confident more connected you know being their true self at work and and therefore more productive yeah you know? yeah. yeah everyone wins yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no and we talk about any us about you know doing what you love with people you love mm. and that is really important because he said spend a lot of time there mm. but also being authentic right so there's if you're trying to be something that you're not it's going to be really hard to be happy no matter how hard you try. Is that fair? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. I just had a conversation with the leader, you know, last week where we were talking about what he did and whether what he did was a good idea or not. And I just said to him, but I think you could question what you did, but what you did was that was you being you. <laughs> you, know, you, can't, you shouldn't be turning yourself into another person to be a good leader. You, the best kind of leader is being is being you with some tools, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah sure, <laughs> with some good tools. But yeah, yeah. It's, it, ultimately, this work, the work we do, should make people the best version of what they actually already are. Yeah, mm. yeah. It's part of our vision. It's a part of our vision. It's people being authentic and being their true selves. And I think a lot of people feel like they've got to bend themselves into certain shapes to achieve things in life. And there's definitely some disciplines that'll help you. But you can, you can, you've got. There's a lot of leeway there to show good leadership disciplines or good you know team contrib- contributor disciplines without having to kind of be a certain type or act in a certain way and and the things people have got bs radars they can pick up when someone's not being real or being true to themselves and which diminishes people's respect for you you di- and when you diminish when that happens you're di- diminishing respect for yourself and it just it just feeds off itself so it can either feed positively or negatively and so that authentic, that authentic piece is really important now, I know that in New Zealand, we're going through some pretty tough times at the moment. I mean, we've obviously got an economic, I'm not sure if I'm going to call it a recession because I don't like that word, but economic downturn for sure, I know. And I still think you can actually make those things anyway. But then um, got an economic downturn and obviously that puts a lot more pressure on business owners, a lot more pressure on people working. What are the kind of the common things that you're seeing in the workplace at the moment? I think a lot of, I, I, I have a huge amount of respect for anyone trying to run a business right now. Yeah. It, is, it just takes so much courage to stare down the expectations that you have of yourself, let alone the expectations everyone else has of you. You, know, you set up a business, you get going, you hope you're going to be able to help people and make a profit in the, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in the process. But there's just so much weight and anyone who, who puts their hand up to run a business or lead a business is just... It hats off, man. It just takes courage. And so I think there's just a lot more to juggle right now. I think out of COVID and the working from home, all the, a lot of different expectations around what employees were looking for and mm. what they need or feel like they need, um, that's kind of been layered up. So there is just a lot more resting on business leaders, not just to make sure people are engaged and doing the great work, but they've also got to be across often now in quite some detail, people's personal circumstances, because if someone's working from home, there's reasons for that. Some of those reasons are, are optional. Some of those are not. And so and, a, and an employer has to have an appreciation of all these different dynamics going on for people, whereas in the past, perhaps you could have seen, hey, you come to work, do your thing, head home. And there might be some flexibility around that um, mm. from, a, from a coming and going point of view. But now there's just so many layers to it. And that that is a that is a lot of pressure uh, being brought to bear on anyone who's responsible for others. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's one thing we're seeing. It's huge, isn't it? We always sort of thought that technology would make things a whole lot easier, but in some respects, it's added a whole lot more complexity, hasn't it? I just love <laughs> yeah. the five minute faff around at the start of a meeting where everyone's sort of swearing and cursing over Zoom or trying to get it all up and working. But if we can actually stay in the conversation, you're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> that's all I have to say. Yeah. Okay, Ruth, so, I mean, the, with the work that you're doing with people, what is it sort of, what are you focusing on mostly at the moment, do you think? We are finding that the main focus tends to be training people in disciplines and areas where 
they are lacking knowledge or lacking the tools that, that they need to be able to see the change that they're wanting to see either in their people or in themselves as leaders. So that tends to take the form of one-on-one training uh, if it's a particular area that someone wants to grow in or it's it's with groups you know with with whole teams where there gets to be not only learning tools and disciplines but also getting to have those facilitated conversations where you're deciding Mm. as a team or as a business how you're going to approach that you know particular area of challenge whether it's how you do feedback in your business or how you you know how leaders might coach their people to to take more responsibility yes yeah. and and in terms of what we're ending up doing the training work in it's across a range of different leadership skills how leaders can have conversations with the people that they're working with to get the best out of them and and also interpersonal skills not necessarily just for leaders but how, how do I have an assertive conversation and then and then personal disciplines so how how can I be more confident in the work that I have to deliver or how can I manage my workload and priorities better? So it's that it's the personal disciplines and the interpersonal work. It's interesting because before we, we came onto the podcast, we talked about you know, this whole responsibility, accountability, holding people accountable. And mm-hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to do, isn't it, as a business owner? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you know yourself from your own business. I know I do. That whole accountability thing, it feels a bit icky. It's kind of like, oh, you know, I don't really, it sounds almost old fashioned. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but yet yeah, it actually it's a bit retro but, it is yeah. a bit retro yeah but at the same time it's really important right mm-hmm. totally yeah uh, you, ha- you have to start with really clear we've been talking about this on the way here but just the importance of setting really clear expectations and accountability accountability is a real I'm, I'm the kind of person that can have a lot of ideas in my head and I don't necessarily always communicate them clearly enough right so, <laughs> That's, so as, as every other visionary in the whole wide world I think yeah <laughs> I know, I know. I'm on NFP so that doesn't help things terribly well because um, I'm bouncing all over the place but so you have got to have good self-awareness to know what your limits are but you, yeah. you have to you have mm-hmm. to set at the outset accountability becomes harder when you haven't set clear expectations we've yeah. probably got more to say on this as well Did, yeah, it's it's that it's going to be really difficult for me to hold a person accountable to something that hasn't been really clearly set out in the first place. Mm-hmm. And not only that, but that we've both agreed if we if we're both seeing different versions of what the goal was or what the expectation was, then it's it's going to be harder for us to have that accountability conversation. So that that early on conversation becomes one of the most important things for accountability and makes accountability easier in the end because you've said what would doing this well look like? You know, what whether it's a team goal or it's an individual goal, what would what would success actually look like? Let's describe it. And then it's going to be easy for me to ask you in at the deadline or yep. whenever, how did that go? Where have you got to? So setting it up well, I think, helps to take some of the discomfort out yeah. of it. Yeah. But yeah. And I think also one of the things that can help is is that team goals around accountability as much as possible. You know, individuals still need to be held to performance standards, but where you've got team goals, it means the whole team's agreed, mm-hmm. and ideally, it's going to work if the teams had a chance to have a really good argument or debate about uh, what they're committing to. But once those once those goals have been set by the team, it's like there's a natural peer pressure towards achieving it and so I think that takes some of the pressure off the leader to do all the accountability work themselves you know people will be more keen to hold themselves accountable and each other yeah but ultimately the leader's got to got to stand up to be the one to have those conversations that 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 will ask the question you know where have you got to what what's getting in your way yeah and giving feedback you know giving regular feedback I think one of I think that um I've heard it's a couple of objections to holding people to account uh, is that oh, if I if I hold them to account, they'll get they'll, they'll this won't turn up to work tomorrow. You know, mm-hmm. and and that's that's a very real concern, and especially around COVID when we went through a massive labour shortage when mm-hmm. businesses were absolutely cranking, people were just getting you know would, would would literally joke with us, man, we'll take anything with a pulse, you know. Even my dogs on the payroll, kind of type thing, you know, because <laughs> yeah. um, just they were just that hungry for for manpower to get 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 through the work. And and so they're concerned that if they actually just kind of challenge people, that people will throw their toys. They're also concerned that you know that either they won't come to work or it'll look more like more of a bigger deal than it actually is. So 
say performance managing me now or or that oh you know this has escalated quickly and and people take it the wrong way and often it's normally due to an absence of a culture of expectations that, hey when you come here this is your role and this is your best it's hoping we'll, you'll achieve through your role and this is you know these are your, these are your goals or your metrics however you want to describe them you can mm-hmm. make it pretty basic or get pretty pretty sophisticated with that depending on the kind of business you're in but if it's not part of the narrative and in your own and it's in your own way then then it becomes harder to kind of just have the conversations when you need to and i think also i mean it was i was in a we were in a workshop a couple of weeks ago and just someone said, oh man, how do you just give someone some feedback without it looking like it's going to be a big dust up and, you know, where it's going to turn into fisticuffs and all the rest of it. And, you know, there are some tools that you can deploy that keeps it there. But I mean, feedback's a breakfast of champions. I mean, as a husband and wife team, we're each other's biggest advocates, but we're also each other's cr- biggest critics, right? And so it makes for some pretty testy conversations, but it's necessary if we're gonna, ever going to get better. Yeah, And so... Feedback has just got to be, it, it, it is probably, if, if someone said, what's the most important skill right now for leaders to master in order to have high-performing teams, I'd say just get good at giving people ob- objective, data-driven feedback. That's the, that's, that will help you to, it'll, it'll help you to get to the bottom of issues quicker. It'll, you can deal with issues while they're small before they blow up, because often, sometimes we're, we're asked to help coach a leader through dealing with a problem, a problem person in their team. And sometimes the actual issue was the fact that it wasn't dealt with earlier yeah. and people have been putting it off and putting it off. And it's normally due to a lack of confidence and a, a sense of a lack of skill and what do I do? So, yeah, we, we, we teach a couple of models to just help people uh, get going around that. I think the data-driven thing is really important as well. I know when we teach people to give feedback, we always say, you know, it's best to have sort of three data points you can actually be specific about. Otherwise, it ends up being a little bit like a husband and wife conversation, you know, like, oh, you're so lazy. Well, what do you mean by that? Yeah, yeah, oh, well, yeah. you know, you're just lazy. Well, give me an example. I can't give you one. You're just always lazy. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's not helpful for anybody in the, in the um, you have to go specifically. Yeah, totally. Well, when I asked you to do this, this is what happened. And then there was also this example here. And, yeah. and here's a third data point, And this is why. And, and yeah, I'm, it's, it's always difficult, right? I always sort of say when I have those conversations, sometimes you feel like you much rather shove your head down the toilet and have the conversation. <laughs> but. Yeah, but yeah. you have to have it. Otherwise, it, it just you, right it snowballs. It gets worse and worse, right? It can be in, 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 in situations that, that are just like turn into complete train wrecks yeah. and they go legal or something like that. <laughs> yeah. but they, you know, not every time, but a lot of times it can be avoided when, when you just sort of, I see something, I'm not happy with that. I need to. And even if it's an expectation you haven't conveyed, mm-hmm. you can still let someone know when something's not quite right. But, but, but on the same side of it, it's about making sure that if you're going to have to deliver the not so encouraging feedback and perhaps pull someone up on something. Mm. You've actually been putting some money in the bank by actually saying to someone, hey, love this work. And specifically what I love about the work you've done is this, this, and this, or this is what I appreciate about you and what you bring to the team and, and being really specific. So it's data driven both ways, right. whether you're giving a positive, positive or constructive, yep. it's got, mm. it's got some substance to it and it's got some meat to it yeah, yeah. We, we talk about that in our core value stuff as well it's like you, you know we recognize people for core values again it's quite important to be quite specific mm. you know it's great that you are helping first and we saw this activity that really showed that's what you were doing mm-hmm. just that again they've got a really strong data point they can tie it back to and it's reinforcing positive behavior yeah, yeah. but just just in terms of humans i mean like we actually like boundaries right i mean people get worried that oh no we can't set accountability because we you know people have to be able to count them um, most people actually enjoy knowing where those boundaries are what they can do, what they can't do. Mm. And we all enjoy celebrating success. Mm. So the point of having a boundary is you've got something where you can also go, yay, we achieved it or we we were, um, you know, that was a great okay. project. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so true. Yeah. 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 And, and engagement goes up when people are getting regular feedback and it doesn't have to be positive only. If people are hearing when they're not doing well, that increases their engagement. But you do need the balance of the positive, right? <laughs> yes. you know? yeah. And I think it, there needs to be an underlying trust. Mm. So something that helps you as a leader to to have a better pathway for giving people feedback is that you've built trust. You've done all of those things that help them to know that you've got their back. You're giving positive feedback, but you're also you're asking for feedback. You're spending time getting to know them. Mm. Pretty pretty basic stuff, but. Um, yeah, and probably a bit too much to go into here, but how you build that trust. But if you can just do a few things that build that sense that you are for your people, yep. uh, then then that is really the groundwork mm. for, for being able to say the, the tough thing when it needs to be said. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we actually, 
um, have worked up a module on boundaries for the workplace and because some people just don't know, leaders don't know what they can expect of others and they don't know how to, sometimes some leaders struggle to kind of let people know when they're not comfortable or happy with something or, or how to just make sure that, you know, people, and it's not necessarily to deal with bad behavior, but it's just, just when people know, for people to help them know their own limits about what they're up for and what they're not. So we, we, we develop that because we know it can really, really help. And it's okay to set, it's okay to set boundaries with people and those kind of things. I, you know, I know someone who just often will have people constantly dropping into their office and they like, they're tearing the hair out. I'm just trying to get stuff done. They have a huge amount, a big number of direct reports, so yep. that makes it challenging in the first instance. But then there's just the people that don't just drop in to actually ask a specific, particular question. They rock in to kind of have the yarn. And as much as this person loves a good yarn, this person has things to do. And so, and their frustration is they don't know, they haven't learned how to say, hey, right not now. now, you know, <laughs> and, and um, you know, what do you need from me right now? Can this wait? Is this important? And that, And that's taking that up the chain, not just with people that are reporting, but also when the, when the senior leaders turn up and, and one of them, it's like, how do I set boundaries with them? Yep. Um, and that's a, that's a whole, a whole nother thing, but you're right. People need, they need a playing field. They need to know yep. where they stand and where the boundaries are and what the goal line is and what's out and what's in. Yep. Um, it's uh, the sporting analogy is pretty handy. I actually, I was reading something the other day and it was, you know, it's talking about even with incentive schemes, like people like games. We actually mm. like games and we like winning. And, and the thing mm. about games is that there are rules, right? You know, the rules of the game, you know, what position you're playing, you know, what the end game is and what you're trying to achieve. And therefore you can actually work towards it. If you don't know all those things, how do you work towards it? Yeah. Mm. Hey, I wanted to ask an interesting question because you just said, you know, the span of control, like if you've got, what is the ideal number of people a person can manage? Is there a limit? I've got my own views, but I'm just interested to yeah. hear what you have to say. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> I think as with anything, there are factors and, you know, as to how much someone can manage. So their own skill as a leader come into it, how much other workload they're carrying aside from simply managing others. But I would usually say anything over about seven and you're getting you're getting taxed. Yep. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's becoming you, you're you're likely to be giving less unless it's all you're doing. If you're not really having to do a whole lot of strategic work or or other type of delivery work, yeah, you may be able to. You know, I know quite a few leaders that are doing up to nine, mm -hmm. ten people, but but that's all that they're doing. I find that they're struggling with it. Yeah. You know, that's what we'll find. They're just there are challenges with that many. And I think people can do it for a time, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's sustainable to go on. And I suppose optimum, optimum number, oh, that's a challenging one. I think, yeah, yeah I think five, yeah. you know. Um, I've but, always said no more than six. Say? I've always said no more than six, I think, because I think yeah. that six is where it starts to become a little bit challenging. Like you said, mm -hmm. it does very much depend on the leader, it depends on exactly what they're doing in the business. But, you know, six humans is actually quite a lot of humans yeah. to look after. Yeah. And if you're really yeah. going to take the time to build the trust, get to know them, work with them, your job as a leader is to remove obstacles and barriers and help them yeah. on their journey, then that requires input and time. And so, yeah, and then you've got the business as usual as well as all the special projects on the go as well. It becomes really challenging. Yeah, and we, yeah. And we say to, we say to uh, leaders, especially young leaders that are going through, or, or rookie leaders, they may not be young, but they're just, they're just early in their leadership journey, is that leadership actually is work. It's, and it's, but that's, a very that's very tough to navigate when you are required to stay on the tools as well as have others report into you, mm -hmm. that can that can be really really difficult because you're focused on. Sometimes you might be doing the same work as the people that are mm -hmm. reporting into you, um, and so you know what that takes in terms of effort and energy and focus and all those kind of things. But yet you're the one who gets lumped with all the tricky questions and can mm -hmm. I go to lunch and what's you know all yeah. those kind of things, and that can that can be very very taxing. So so how the how it's how your role is structured and what you're expected to deliver for that. Is yeah, is is the big, is the big the big piece. Usually, what we'll see is that if someone's got too many direct reports, they're they're dropping the ball on one thing or the other, and and often it ends up being the leadership that they drop the ball on, you know, because mm. the deadlines and Pressure. the deliverables 
I don't know, they're just a bit more like a burning, you know, a burning signal, come and, come and deal with me, mm. whereas the, the leadership, it, it always feels like it can wait because it's never super urgent, it's just important. And yeah. yeah, so if you can keep it to a lower number where it's possible, that just helps you to, to give more to it, mm. give more to the leadership. And yet I think there are some people with a little more capacity, sure. you know, they just have that capacity mm. to, to understand people quickly and yeah, maybe it's a natural thing or they've just had more time and practice at it. Also how needy your team is, part of it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So right. some people need a lot of leadership. They need a lot of time in terms mm. of leadership, whereas others, they still need leadership. It's just the, the amount in terms of time will be less, but it doesn't mean that thought doesn't need to go into it for them. Yeah. It's interesting. I was reading, there's a book called People by um, EOS, and it was really there. They said that make sure the people you put into leadership roles are actually leaders because sometimes, you know, the top salesperson gets put into the sales leadership role, but they're not really a leader. And I was, it was, gave me the, the thought in my head, like, is leadership, are you born a leader? Can you be made a leader? Is it a bit of both? I mean, I've got, again, I've got my own opinions, but I'd love, mm. love to hear what you think about that. Yeah. I think, I think, yeah, it's very common. And actually in sales are very common, you know, oh man, you, you nail the numbers, mate. You know, you can, you can show everyone else how to do it, you know, and, and it's, it's very common for people that be put in that position to, to step out of it. Mm. They, they'll go into sales leadership for a season and realize it's, oh, they're off the tools. They're not out there hustling and doing the FaceTime what they love. So it's a common, it is a common profession or, di- or business discipline that actually suff- suffers from people going in and out of leadership. Mm. And I think that most people can learn essential leadership skills, but there will be some people that have a greater capacity to to hold more intention and 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 be able be comfortable with a lot more more plates spinning than others. So so I think yeah, that, but many people can actually lead and often do. And it starts with your technical capability, which is yeah. that you know where you're a salesperson and you're amazing at sales, and so you have that technical ability. And I say, well, let's scale that and put you into a leadership role. But, you know, going from being on the tools to being on people yeah. is, is a very different transition. And you've got to want to do it, right, too. I mean, I you think do. that's why you see those people drop flopping and out because they actually love being in front of customers. Mm. And you take that away from them and suddenly it's like, oh, I don't think I like yeah, this, this side of it. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's what, what I was going to say, Deborah. I think yep. a big part of it is do you, do you get a quiver in your liver at the idea of leading people? You know, does it excite you? Does, mm. Do you think, yes, I want to empower other people? Like that idea of I will help you to get unstuck. I will help to empower you. I'll help you to know what you're going after. Yeah. And so that can be a huge range of people. Like I really do believe that some people are born with some special stuff that makes them amazing as leaders, but they still need to learn mm. how to do it. And yet I have seen people that may not have been naturally like that, you know, naturally a leader as a child or or even as a young adult, but because they want to learn to do it, they've learned and become very good leaders. So there's not, it's not that like there's one pathway to being a great leader, but I do think one of the biggest elements is that they want to yeah. do it, yeah. you know, and that they're actually, they're actually prepared to make that mental shift from I do to I support you to do you know i I, empower and enable the serving role you know yeah Yeah. the serving leadership role yeah 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 Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting isn't it do you think no i think i think there's a little bit yes there's certainly people who um well people who love people naturally like you said from the from the very early age you were all about helping people so was i Uh, i was always the person who wanted to help everybody make sure they're all being looked after so there's obviously a natural thing that comes into us when we're born but then i do believe that yes you can develop and certainly I, you don't get born with all the tools that you need to actually no, be a leader. Totally. So, you, so you might have the want and the desire and the yeah. and the, the people loving part part of it. But there's a you know being a leader has got well being a leader you got to be organised. You've got to have you know, say the good conversations, the difficult conversations. You're there to remove those obstacles and barriers, really lead and manage people to help them achieve their role. Mm. It's it's tough, right? Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. It is, and and you can you can have the charisma and and, and be quite comfortable in front of an audience. And, and I've I've made that fatal mistake in my lifetime where it's like, oh, well, I'm a bit of a leader, I can make things happen and, you know, rustle a crowd along, get people going <laughs> on stuff. But actually the the back end, the organization, the discipline, the planning, those are all things that, that you need to work on. Whereas some person might be amazing at planning and knowing what needs to be said, but needs a bit of a nudge to really stick their neck up and actually say what has to be said. Mm-hmm. So it's a, um, yeah, everyone everyone brings it. But I think I love Ruth what Ruth just said about the hunger for it. You've got the hunger for it. 
then you can work with that. Yeah. The um, quiver in the liver is what she actually said, and I quite like. I've not heard that. So I always talk about what makes your, what makes your heart sing, but the quiver in the, in the yes. liver is it's great. Yeah, it's that <laughs> yeah. really deep inside of you. It's like, yeah, I want to do yeah. this. Yeah, or the Marie Kondo spark joy. You know, yep. I don't just use that for decluttering. It's like you know, life choices. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a little ching about you know about yeah? I really want to see people grow mm. and see people mm. come better and. And mm. and it's the thinking ahead too, you know. The leader yep. does that that thinking. They're one step ahead. They're looking further down the road than mm. everybody mm. else's. And yeah. and, that, and that's it's actually true. that that's the buzz I get in our work is that we're we'll sitting there with a with a client doing some work of, of some description. I remember it happening earlier this year. We were doing some team development with a group of people. You know, they were sitting down, understanding the personality mix in the room. We'd done some testing, and then we were workshopping this whole thing out. And you were just watching the penny drop around the room, and just that. That's that's a dream. that's just a buzz, man. That's totally a buzz when you see people suddenly realize how much they now appreciate the strengths that someone brings. What they thought was an irritation and a frustration with their relationship is a strength, and they could they saw how they could value it and not let it get under their skin and 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 become um, collabor co collaborators mm. or people who can collaborate together rather than um, collaborators as a word. Collaborators, um, maybe, but oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. That one, yeah, uh, yeah, that one. Or, you know, where they can just truly go from being ad adversarial in the workplace to mm. being truly, truly partners because, oh, I get it now. This is how you see things and that's that's why. And so when we see that, that just totally gets me jazzed. Yeah. You know, when, you, when the lights turn on. So, so yeah, so that's, you, everyone's got to find the, 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 what, the quiver in their liver and that might be to do something amazing technical and write code or it could be just to help people figure stuff out or just serve great, serve customers well or mm -hmm any number of or put great strategies together that kind of bring about change and influence so yeah that's what that's our part of our quiver <laughs> i think we see it as well when we work with teams who are going through the eos process we talk about having visionaries and integrators and so in the past there was always a leader at the top of the organization who was somehow expected to do both and they're mm. two very very different roles right one is opening doors one is really really big picture thinking big problem solving mm. not so great definitely d developing the culture but not so great at actually having the the more difficult conversations than the minute you mm. detail. Mm. And so we have these two roles, visionary and then the integrator, who is more about the managing of the people, the making sure everything's on track, the project plans, the profit and loss, all that kind of stuff. And I did it with, with a couple who were married, working together. Um, and as soon as they actually understood that one of them was very much a visionary and one was very much an integrator, suddenly the personal element came out of it. So rather than it being oh, Lisa, you're always holding me back. You know, you're such a pain in the ass. It was like, ah, you're being an integrator. And that's what an integrator does. And mm -hmm. so therefore it becomes less personal. Not, And that's a lot of the work that you do around the, the personality profiling and stuff too, isn't it? So understand what what makes people tick so you can understand where they're coming from. So it's not a, it's not a personal thing. It's just that actually they've got different strengths and different weaknesses. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we just, we absolutely love this work and have seen some real changes in teams as a mm -hmm. result of it, mm -hmm. where people are understanding you, this is how you are, this is, you didn't make yourself like this, this is your, it's your inherent nature and we can learn to balance our inherent nature, but it's that realising what a, what a gift it is. And I think it, once you understand a bit more of the mechanism behind the way that another person perceives the world or makes decisions or, you know, has conversations, likes to be in meetings, how, what's happening for them in their mind when they're doing that, mm -hmm. then it, it suddenly doesn't become this personal irritating thing at all. Yeah. It's suddenly like, oh, you're just coming at this from a different perspective than me and you can actually see that it's good for you that that person is, is different. It's yeah. good for the it's good for the end result at least. You know? Well and it, it's for the greater good of the business, you've got to have different people, right? The diversity is actually yeah. really important because that means I mean I'm a terrible detail person in some areas. And in other areas I'm completely anal so I've got different different um, skill sets there. But if you mm. if it was all just down to me we'd miss some pretty important stuff in the business. So thank goodness I have somebody who's much more detail-focused who will pick up on those things, whereas they would be absolutely horrified about going out and doing keynote speeches or going to networking events or just opening doors of people. Mm. And I love that stuff. So again, it's about working out where you naturally fit and what makes your liver quiver and off you go. Very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, um, no. That's okay. Tell, tell, me, tell me about the personality profile stuff that you do, a little bit about... Yeah, the work that you do there. So we do a lot of that for teams, but also for individuals. So when we're working with teams, we've got a number of different tools we can draw on. Mm -hmm. uh, and the purpose of 
though, using those tools is to build trust in the team yep. and to help people to understand each other. So understanding leads to trust. If I can understand you, where you're coming from, what makes you tick, it helps me to trust you. And it, it's it, there's a little bit of a magic that goes on with that. There's a, once a person knows another person, it's like trust is automatically built. And once we understand the reasons behind why people do what they do, it, it just builds a bond. And then that means it's easier for the team to do all the other things that make it a strong team. You know, psychological safety is number one as far as team performance goes. And so if people can feel safe in the team and being known is a big part of feeling safe, mm. then they are able to have those challenging conversations with each other and do all the other things that make them impactful as a team. So we do a lot of that work around knowing each other. Sometimes that's personal histories, you know, yep. learning about each other's life experiences. We do that. We do that. We do that. Patrick Lencioni, was that originally his stuff or not? That's one of his ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we use it in our yeah. annual planning stuff. I think it's a yeah. great exercise. So yeah. Cool. So yeah. powerful and yet so simple. Yeah. 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 And then other yeah. tools like, like personality tests, you know, yeah. those, those are quite helpful. And then... And just um, learning techniques for, for building trust in terms of giving each other feedback. So how, yeah. how you give feedback so that you can you can really be truthful with each other. Um, and then we also do personality work with individuals. So helping individuals to understand themselves for their own development. So, you know, an example of something like time management, you know, so I'm struggling to, to prioritize my workload. There could be a number of reasons underneath that. It mm. might be that I struggle with distraction. You know, part of my personality is that I'm I'm easily, oh, there's something interesting. Oh, look, look, look. Or it could be that I'm someone who takes on too much. You know, yeah. I just, I'm over disciplined and responsible and that's making me load up my plate to the point where, you know, nobody could possibly hope to get done all the things that, that I'm hoping to get done. So I think often if you look under the hood and understand your own personality, mm -hmm. that can help you then to know rather than slapping, you know, a bunch of tools in your face, hey, just be more like this. It's like, well, let's figure out who you actually are. Let's work out what your personal struggles are with this thing that you're wanting to change and be realistic then about how you will change that so that you're not, you know, it comes back to what we were saying before, you know, so that you can be authentically you while you try to develop better time management skills and that kind of thing. So that's where we find assessments, you know, really helpful for that. But we also use them for hiring people. So we, as part of the process, we, we stress that it's very important how that gets done, but we will, we will use an assessment as a way of helping hiring manager hiring leader to to determine does this person have the competency set that we're looking for and it's not to say oh the test says you don't you don't have it you don't have it it's no it's to flag where does this person is are they likely to naturally have some struggles in this area so that I'm I'm able to ask them some really good interview questions when mm. I speak to them and I'm able to ask the referees some really targeted questions so if the assessment's showing me they might be one of these people that overloads themselves, then I can ask Just an interview that. question that probes around that. What mm. are your strategies in terms of overloading yourself? You know, what do you do to make sure that you you balance that? And if the person's able to tell about how they've they've learned some really good skills to to not, you know, to set boundaries around themselves and what they expect of themselves, then you know you've got you've got a winner in that competency area, you know. So it's very important not to use the tools as a you're in, you're out kind of tick box exercise, but as an informing thing to help you go a bit deeper in the way that you do your you do your recruitment practice. Yeah, yeah so. I like that because yeah, yeah. as you said, it can highlight some things that you get because people are often aware of these things and if it's how they're dealing with it, isn't that that's really the key thing for you. If they're not aware of it, it's probably a big red flag, but if they're aware of it and they're doing something about it, then you can go, okay, at least this person is taking some responsibility and, mm. and is cognizant of the fact that they've got a, a challenge there. Yeah, and often those people will actually probably be some of the strongest people in that area because they've had to struggle to become good yeah. at it. You know, they've had to struggle to learn to prioritise or whatever the challenge might be. You know, someone who's a bit straight and harsh with people. Yep. You know, they might have had to learn to build in you know, taking the time to listen and mm -hmm. to be interested in people's lives when they really just want to get the job done, <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, when you, when you, but if you can, if, during a, a, a recruitment process, if you can probe into that, 
and mm. and find out where the struggles might be. That's mm. that helps you to ask intelligent interview and referee questions. Yeah, Perfect. but but mostly would yeah, it's probably more for training and development. That we yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, one one of the ways we use it is when when a business is looking to possibly put someone into leadership, mm. then but they that they might. Uh, use an assessment just to give this, this person some basic baseline self-awareness of their communication style and what that means for leadership. You know, like if this is your communication style, this is how this is going to impact how you will influence others for better or for worse. The, you know, the, and, these, and it just gives them a, a sort of neutral language and a, a neutral view of themselves rather than just being based on subjective opinions about what the people have seen today. It's like, well, no, this is what this is what you lined up against a million other people around the world <laughs> might tend to be like. This is something to be aware of. Positive and negative. So you're not just drawing on the kind of the risks, but you're also looking to accentuate positives as well. And so um, but we, we will uh, do, an, do an assessment there before giving them a bit of a one-on-one on what leadership actually is and, and then doing some coaching around, you know, what their, career, their development pathway might look like. Because for different people who are coming into a, a leadership role, um, you know, how they might uh, how they might grow in their leadership will be different for different people. What's some, but yeah, that's, I mean, coming Coming back to, oh, I'm sorry, losing track of the the, um, the question. But the, the the point the point is that if you want to create some neutrality around self awareness, then assessment becomes jolly handy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's a risky that one. It's okay. <laughs> it's all good. Okay, so we, then we can probably talk all day about this because we obviously have a, a natural love of people and wanting to see people do their best, but also see businesses. You know, have people fight for the greater good and see businesses do the best as well. Mm. Top three tips. Let's just say there's a, a business owner listening in and thinking. Oh, I don't know if my leadership team is working properly or I'm not sure if I'm I mean one of the things you'd write at the beginning was communication right yeah. often we have to look in within ourselves and go hey is it my fault like I had this issue when I had interns mm-hmm. I would um, talk at a million miles an hour tell them what I wanted get them let them go off and do it then they'd come back with something completely different mm-hmm. and I used to get really frustrated then I thought hold on a second that's actually my responsibility if mm-hmm. I haven't taken the time to explain and, and, and make sure they understood what I was explaining. Mm. So then I turned it on its head and went, right, it's my, my issue. I have to deal with it. Mm. Um, and I would then ask them, hey, can you just repeat back to me what you've heard me say? And then they come back with something. I go, oh, no, that's not what I thought I was saying. So obviously, mm. I haven't been very clear in my communica- communication. This is actually what I was looking for. Mm. And these are the outcomes I'm looking for. And so, you know, I think that communication, we may think, particularly as visionaries, we've got it all sorted. We know what we're doing. Everybody else knows what we're doing, but often pretty, they don't. It's pretty clear in our heads. It's really clear in our heads, yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't understand why they can't mind read. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, think top, I think top three tips for any, any business leader is to, is to periodically ask for feedback. Yeah. As, as like, hey, how, you know, after a meeting, pull one of the trusted members aside and say, hey, how, how was I in that meeting? Can you honestly tell me how I was? Yeah. You know, was I... Great, bad, not so good. We was so good. We was so. We could have been better. Mm-hmm. Um, establish a, a, establish a culture where it's safe to to give feedback by asking for it and receiving it first. So so modeling modeling that I think is probably one of the things I would be always. And it's something you need to do permanently. Yeah, you can nearly get complacent and think you've mastered a particular discipline and think, oh man, <laughs> I don't have a problem with that anymore. Because I think we all suffer from that. It's part of the human condition is to get complacent, and that's when the wheels can start to fall off. You have to. You have to regularly get your own set of feedback so you know how you're tracking. And that can be pretty brutal, but it's the only way you stay sharp. And, but if you are, but if you are asking for it, it sets the tone for you to be able to go, well, you know, maybe this, I, I, you will have to give it sometimes. And, and if you're brave enough to, um, to receive it, then people will respect you when you have to share it as well. So that's, that's mm-hmm. one piece of wisdom. That, that comes to comes to mind, yeah. Perfect, yeah. Yeah. Um, Top three. I've probably got more than three, but I'll <laughs> see if you can drink it down to three. Try yeah, and, try and squeeze it down. I think the big thing for me would be building trust with your people, mm-hmm. and you know, we we teach on how to do that, but it's it's not hard to find resources on how do you build trust between you and your team, and also between them, and that is the bedrock, you know, on which you can then do everything else as a leader the other thing I think we've touched on this already but is is clarity around what you're expecting of people clarity on people's roles what helping them to determine what their goals are for their role and and making sure it's clear between team members Mm -hmm. if you've got more than one direct report how who's going to be tackling what part of of the work so yeah trust and clarity and then and then that following up you know so having that that you're following up with your people, you're having one-on-ones with them, 
And it's kind of goes full circle because that then builds more trust, right? <laughs> yes. So if you're following up and people know that you actually care about mm. that thing you send out, you know, you, you don't just sort of send out a thing for someone to work on and then not ask about it. Yeah. And if I can add a fourth thing. It yes, go on then. <laughs> making time for your development. I, I see it everywhere that it's that whole, you know, it's always harder to make time to work on the business than it is to work in the business. And it's the same with yourself. It's always easier to do your deliverables than it is to think about how you're delivering what you do as a leader. Mm. And yet you've got to champion that for yourself because unless you you are lucky enough to have someone leading you who holds you accountable to it, really you have to you have to be the one championing, spending time and energy on making yourself a better leader. Mm. And whether that's listening to podcasts or it's reading or it's just spending time reflecting on how you've done your work. But yeah, I always am so passionate about encouraging <laughs> leaders. Take that time. You know, if I'm if I'm I've got a client I'm coaching, I'll be saying to them, make sure you put aside another hour in this week to mm. reflect on what we were coaching on. Yeah. You know, that's where you'll get the real value. If you're doing some training, put time aside to to build yourself yep. yeah and I think some goals around it yeah I think you're absolutely right and you've got to have it in your calendar right you've got to have it booked out as well otherwise it will just get filled with other things mm. that's the reality you know you, if you leave your calendar open it will get filled with whatever is the stuff that's going on so mm. um, I always say to people you know, book in clarity breaks make sure you've got some time every single week or fortnight a month whatever works for you mm. but just have some time that is just for yourself mm. where you can't be interrupted where you can't be um, driven by other things that are going on but you have that time mm. to do that inner thought so good. Yeah. So right. It's like I I will often say, see your own development is one of your most important customers. You know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you wouldn't say, oh, hang on a minute, most important customer. I have to go and do these other things. You would say, no, I booked an hour with this person. Mm. They're my most important customer. I'm going to stay with them. So yeah, <laughs> do that for yourself because out of that will flow all the leadership work you do. Yep. You know that time that you spend doing that will make everything else you do better yep mm. perfect hey as you said there's probably a lot more things you could share but if we want to find out more easy to get hold of you isn't it how do they find you oh easy um just harrowfield.co.nz yep and um they can book online for a for a catch-up or give us a ring or flick us an email yep and we can we can we can talk shop you know if they've got if they've got behaviors in the business they want to improve or behaviors in the business that are already good and they want to build on them mm. you know uh whether it's within an individual or a team just reach out and we can we can jam on what a, a good solution that is going to be fit for purpose. That's a really good point, actually, isn't it? Because it's not just about self-improvement from where something's not quite going right, but it's actually about developing high-performing teams, which is actually taking it to the next level up. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that's probably where most of our work lies because, you know, often it's the leaders that can spot, oh, this could be better, yeah. you know, that then go looking for that kind of help. Yeah, so 100%. It doesn't always have to be a big problem being fixed, but more something that you just love to see stronger, mm. become stronger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think you know, working on working on building your strengths is always going to help to mitigate weaknesses and bits and pieces. It won't eliminate them, yeah. but it'll certainly give people the confidence to tackle weaknesses because they know there's other areas where they're really winning. Yeah. And that's that's mm. important to, to, to know that and to celebrate that, you know, and, and celebrate and, you know, champion your strengths. Mm, yeah. Perfect. So I can try and recap what we've talked about. We've talked such a lot, but... The first thing was around sort of say clarity and that communication and making sure we're really clear about what we're trying to achieve and having that communication. Being um, accountable means actually setting some boundaries. There's nothing wrong with boundaries. Boundaries are good. I People must. like boundaries. And making it part of a game that you're actually going to play. Mm. It's about making sure that you take time for yourself and work on yourself as much as working with your team. And what was the oil called? Assessment. Assessment, yeah. Assessment. Using your assessment, using assessment tools mm. for a number of different purposes, you know, so getting to learn more about the team and building that trust within the team, mm. which is really, really important, but also potentially for um, using it in interviews to get deeper into where a person's kind of psyche is and what's going on for them. Yeah. 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 And I think, I think, I think that, uh, the big thing with assessment is to to use it wisely and use it well. And and so we're, we're really hot on making sure that yeah. that kind of thing is 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 part of a suite of tools you use in that kind of mm -hmm. especially in selection because uh, if you just roll solely on it um you could be missing a beat missing yeah. a trick so yeah there's we've got some got some strong rules and principles around that excellent yeah. well that's really great hey look thank you so much for the, for spending you. the time it's been thank really you. fun i think we're on the same page in terms of developing our people but it's right yeah 100%. great to chat to you thank thanks, you Deborah. all the best mate thanks thanks Deborah. 